So picking up <clears throat> picking up on page 1269. Um, Hamlet and Polonius were talking. If you remember the to back up just a minute, Polonius told the king and queen that Hamlet was mad for love. Um, um, that Hamlet was mad for love, and it is because of uh, Ophelia had turned away his. Stop one second. And it was Ophelia's rejection of Hamlet that caused him to essentially go crazy. And so he comes up with the idea that Hamlet normally walks in the gallery or in the lobby for four hours at a time. And at some time when he's doing that, he'll spy or he will loose his daughter on Hamlet, as he put it, with the king and Polonius standing behind an heiress, listening to everything, right? Right after he says that, they notice Hamlet enters. So if you're thinking of the stage being like this, and you've got the doorways this way, doorways like that, the king and queen of Polonius are probably something like this. Hamlet walks through this door, and they notice him, and the king and queen immediately go aside. It's as if Hamlet doesn't see them, okay? They go inside and Polonius confronts Hamlet. And Hamlet says, you know, you're a fishmonger and stuff, and talks about the sun breeding maggots and carrion, etc. okay? So Polonius turns the conversation, attempts to turn the conversation away from his daughter because he thinks Hamlet's harping on his daughter. And he asks Hamlet, what do you read, my lord? Line 188. Because Hamlet has entered with a book in his hands. All right? Words, words, words. Uh, what is the matter, my lord? That is, what is the matter of the words? What is? What are the words about? Hamlet takes what is the matter to mean like, we would ask that of somebody. If you saw somebody in the head of frown or some kind of strange look on your face, you'd say, what's the matter? What's up? Hamlet, so Hamlet hears Polonius say, what is the matter, my lord? And he says, between who? Uh, the matter that you read. Oh, slander, sir. And he goes on and says, the satirical rogue says here, says here, that old men have gray beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum gum, plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with most weak hands. Okay? So everything he's just described is true. Old men do have gray beards. They're, depending on how old they are, their eyes are kind of runny, you know, all that kind of stuff. He says, All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, that is, it's true, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. For yourself, sir, should be old as I am, like a crab, or if, like a crab, you could go backward. What the is Hamlet talking about? And that's what's going on in Polonius' mind. Polonius is like, what in the world are you talking about? Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. In other words, there is a logical reasoning to it. It's crazy, but within the confines of its craziness, it kind of makes sense. Okay? Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Notice he doesn't address what Hamlet has just said. Okay? So, will you walk out of the air, my lord? And what he means by that is, will you leave this lobby and go out like onto the balcony? Get some sun. And Hamlet says, into my grave. So will you walk out of the air? So imagine a six foot hole and you step 
into it, you leave the air and into the ground. Indeed, that's out of the air. And then he gives another aside. And bear in mind, the asides are lines that only the audience supposedly can hear. Hamlet doesn't hear this next part. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so pro prosperous, blah, 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 prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. All right? So, that's all for us, the audience here. Then he addresses Hamlet. My honorable Lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more will willingly part with all. Now, stop there for a moment. Don't read the rest of it. So what is, how is Hamlet replied? Polonius says, exactly, my honorable Lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. And Hamlet says, you can't take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. In other words, get the hell out of here. You can't take your leave from me because I willingly give it away. Notice the difference between take and give, right? Then he says, accept my life, accept my life, accept my life. What's the accept my life three times for? What, what part of Polonius' final words to him is Hamlet latching on to? This idea of him taking something. If you take something from somebody else, what is that thing to the person you're taking it from? It's a property, a possession, right? You can't take something from somebody that doesn't belong or at least is in the possession of that individual. What is in Hamlet's possession? His life. So he says, you know, first of all, you can't take that from me because I willingly give it, meaning your leave. But then he says, accept my life, accept my life, accept my life. His, he's implying what? You can take that from me. And how? Look how Polonius again said, I'm going to take my leave. I most humbly, Hamlet is kind of saying, you can humbly take my life, take my life, take my life. Is he putting on an ethic disposition? Is he pretending to be crazy? Is this, you know, Hamlet wanting to be killed? Okay. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in and Polonius leaves. Now, who are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern again? The two that are the same. The two that are the same, old friends of Hamlet's, childhood friends of Hamlet's. Okay? They grew up with Hamlet, essentially. And they're, they are at Elsinore for what purpose? To spy on Hamlet. To spy on Hamlet. For the king and queen, right? So, Hamlet addresses them. And they kind of talk a little bit back and forth. Hamlet asks them, How do ye both, as the indifferent children of the earth, indifferent there just meaning ordinary, like Everyday ordinary people. Guildenstern, happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. Now, I think I've mentioned in here before, the goddess fortune is usually portrayed as having a wheel, okay? Now, when he refers to fortune's cap, he's not using the image of fortune as wheel, but the image of fortune as a goddess. And she's wearing a hat, okay? But it translates into this image. 
So this is Fortune's re wheel. Or if you're familiar with the Pat Sajak version, Wheel of Fortune. So what the whole game show is kind of based upon is this image. And so Fortune stands over here, and she's got the wheel, and she turns it. And it, everybody is on it. And it turns differently for each person. Because my fortune is not yours, and not yours, and not yours, etc. And what he's saying is, we're not right here. Okay? We're happy in that we are not over happy, super happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. Okay? So think of a cap like this, and it has a button on the top. He's saying, we're more like somewhere in this area. Because if you're at the button, where are you? Where are you? You're at the very top, you're at the apex. And because Fortune's wheel never stops turning, that means you're soon to do that. Okay? So he's saying that it's, it's still. It's still. It's like a cycle. Yeah, oh yeah, entirely. Entirely. You know, at the beginning of the Oedipus play, Oedipus the King, where's Oedipus? He's up here. He's got everything going for him. King of Thebes, solved the riddle of the Sphinx, married the queen. He has all the power, you know. And what happens? Because the wheel never stops turning, he quickly, very quickly falls. So, on Fortune's cap, we are not the very button, nor the soles of her feet, Hamlet says. So, you're not at the bottom of Fortune's wheel either. Because if they were... What would life be like? Miserable. <laughs> yeah, to put it mildly. Okay? It would be like Oh, that this too, too souling flesh would melt, fall, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed its cannon against self-slaughter. When Hamlet is contemplating suicide, it's the beginning of the play in Act 1, Scene 2. Okay? So, you're not here, and you're not here. So Hamlet makes a pun. Then you live about her waist. Here, in the middle of fortune's favors. Notice again, he's not using the image of the wheel, though. I'm not an artist, so I can't draw a good, you know, picture of a woman. I could do a stick figure, but that would be even more <laughs> disgusting or, or um, not workable. What's he mean in the middle of her favors? Around her waist. And we know that because of what's going to come next. <laughs> Faith, her private's weave. Yep, we're around Fortune's Privates, Hamlet, in the secret parts of Fortune. Oh, most true. She is a strumpet. Old word for slut. Whore. Why? Because Fortune's... Go ahead. Is it because like, a lot of people are in that mid-area? Everybody is at some point. Fortune sleeps with everyone in that meaning, all right? Fortune affects every person, all right? And notice what it also implies. Kings like to think they are where? Up here. And they often are for a period of time, okay? In, in tragedies, kings always in, you know, are up here at some point, but then they fall. In comedies, they might start at the bottom and rise to the top. <clears throat> so, what's the news? Why are you here? That's what what's the news means. None but the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near. So, the world is now an honest place. Turn, turn on any TV, watch any news. Is, is the world, a, that's why Hamlet says, then it's the end of time. 
but your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. And he starts to act almost like a lawyer. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? So Hamlet is saying Elsinore is a prison. Or Denmark, if you want. Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one. So they're saying, Rosencrantz is saying, if you consider Denmark to be a prison, then guess what? He extrapolates from Denmark to say Denmark is merely a microcosm of the entire world. So if you think Denmark's a prison, then the whole world's a prison. Hamlet, a goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. Does Hamlet disagree? Does Hamlet say, no, you're not right. The world is not a prison. Hamlet says, you're right. There are many confines, like 235, places of confinement, okay? Wards and dungeons. We think not so, my Lord. Rosencrantz uses we, not the royal we, but the we, Gildenstern and I, we disagree with you, my lord. We don't think the world is a prison. Why then, tis none to you. And Shakespeare, very next sentence, brings up a huge philosophical question. And it's, it's even more than just philosophical. It's kind of basic human nature, basic human perception, okay? Why then, tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. What is Hamlet's point? It's all about perspective. It's entirely about perspective. Remember, I've mentioned several times, this play is probably the most religious of Shakespeare's plays. St. Paul says, and I can't remember where, somewhere in the New Testament, that anything you do, do to the glory of God. Okay, that's easy to understand. He then goes on and he talks about fasting rules and what kind of stuff you should eat. And he says, it doesn't matter. If eating meat makes you essentially feel guilty or feel bad, then to you, Paul says, eating milk, eating milk, eating meat, sorry, lack of sleep, eating meat is bad. But for somebody else, if eating meat is not bad, then for that person, it's not bad. The problem you run into is when you invite someone to eat and you prepare something you know they won't eat or don't like to eat or can't eat. And that's when he says you essentially violate their conscience or, to use another word, their perspective. Okay, Because you knowingly do that. So, Hamlet says... To me, it's a prison. They say to us, it isn't. In John Milton's Paradise Lost, big long poem, in which he sets out to justify the ways of God to man. It's about the fall of the angels and the Garden of Eden story. Satan has a line where he says, it's better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. And he says, the mind is able to make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Why? You don't even have to read the poem. If the mind can do that and you want absolute supreme power and you're in heaven where there is an absolute supreme power, what does that place become for you? Yeah. Because you don't get what you want. But if you're down in hell and you want absolute supreme power and you think you have it there, then that place becomes your heaven. Okay? So, Rosencrantz, 
Hearing Hamlet say, Denmark in the world, to me, is a prison. Okay. Why then your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. You want more than life can give you, Hamlet. Think for a moment of Hamlet's position. What is he? Prince. Prince? Claudius has told him he is what to the throne? He's the immediate to the throne. He's next in line. What was Hamlet when his father was alive? Next in line. His uncle usurped that position. So when Rosencrantz says, well, it's your ambition that makes it one, he's kind of implying. I think it's very subtle. You want to be king. And that's why this is a prison for you. You don't control all the cards. You don't call all the shots. Hamlet. Oh, God. I could be bounded in a nutshell. I've mentioned this line several times. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. Were it not that I have bad dreams. Okay. Where do dreams come from? Hamlet's going to say the line later. What dreams may come. Okay. And there is actually. Yeah. There's a movie with that title. Robin Williams, Cuba Gooding Jr. Can't remember the. A woman who was in it uh, about a guy who commits suicide. Okay, he commits suicide if I remember correctly because his wife dies, and he's taken on this journey, kind of through hell, because he wants to rescue his wife. Kind of a thing. It's loosely based on, well, part of it at least loosely based on Hamlet. I can be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. So take a nut or your hand, put them together like that so that you have a hollow ball in the middle. And Hamlet says, I could be contained in that. And think of it as infinite space were it not for what? Dreams. What's he suggesting about dreams? They come from outside that space. He's saying dreams don't come from within us. They come from outside us. What's the problem? If I'm a king of infinite space, and a dream comes in from outside, then what? There's a space you're not aware of. <laughs> yeah. Then I'm not a king of infinite space, and there is something else out there. Astrophysicists tell us the universe is, what, 14.6 billion years old. Okay? And it has a certain dimension to it. The very term universe, however, kind of goes against that. Because if the universe has a certain dimension, a spatial dimension to it, a width, let's say, what's beyond that? That is, what does it expand into? Because we're told the universe is constantly expanding. It's what's called the Hubble constant, right? It's moving apart at tremendous speed. The problem with it is it's increasing its speed as it expands. And it's expanding, supposedly, because of the Big Bang. Boom, and everything just keeps moving so before the Big Bang, what was the whatever you call it around the thing that blew up? You can't call it space because space is part of the universe. That's kind of Hamlet's point. What is out there? Gilmanstern latches onto the idea of dreams, which dreams indeed are ambition. See, he's thinking dreams like, I want to do this with my life. 
For the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. Substance. Define substance. What's the substance of this? Paper. Paper. Okay. Actually, that is what's called the accidents of it. What's the substance? What's paper made of? Wood, Wood pulp. Cellulose. That's the substance of it. The accidents is its appearance. What's the substance of this? Cement, rock. Cement, rock, a little bit of water, sand. Okay, all mixed together. Its accidents is cement block, etc. Okay, so the substance is the true essence of something. It's isness, you know. So, Gildenstern. The very substance, the essence of the ambitious, he says, is what? Merely the shadow of a dream. Now think about that for a moment. What casts a shadow? Something solid, something solid or at the very least, something not to guess. I'm not even sure that that's quite accurate. So you have to have a source of light, right? That shines. You can, I can see it. I don't think you can. There's a slight shadow here over this water bottle from that light. Okay. So, but this has substance. It has solidity to it. The shadow of a dream. What kind of substance do dreams have? And we, we kind of go right back to A Midsummer Night's Dream, where Theseus gives his long little speech, kind of an oxymoron there, his long speech about dreams and lovers, poets, and lunatics. So the substance of the ambitious, the essence of the ambitious, is the shadow of a dream. So how substantial, let's say, is the shadow of a dream? Shine a light behind a dream. Dream doesn't have solidity, right? It's airy nothing, as Theseus puts it. Hamlet, a dream itself is but a shadow. Now think about that sentence for a moment. A dream is a shadow. Okay. A shadow is caused by something blocking light. So what is creating the shadow that is the dream? Memories. Louder? Memories. Memories? Keep it, where do dreams come from? Outside. <laughs> That's Hamlet's whole point. What's the essence? Where do these come from? If a dream is a shadow, that means it is an image created by something else, right? Because a shadow is an image of something. It might not be an exact image. If it's an overcast day, you're gonna have very, very slight shadows. If it's a bright sunny day, you're gonna have pretty strong shadows. Shakespeare's getting at Plato's allegory of the cave, okay? Which, very briefly, These people down here, this represents more than one person. These people are chained. There's a wall here, okay? 
These are people walking around. This is a kind of a wall here. These people are walking around here, carrying things and doing things. So there's a fire behind them that does what? It casts their shadow onto this wall, all right? The individuals here are chained and cannot turn around. They do not know that anybody is behind them. All they can see is what is directly ahead of them. For them, what they see directly ahead of them is all of reality. All right? Plato says this, this right here is us. Or Socrates says it. This is our experience of the world. We think we see everything that is real. But he says everything we see, this book, this paper, this bottle, this phone, this body, those bodies, they're all shadows. They're all copies, images of the real thing that's here. Okay? So he talks and says, imagine what it would be like if one of these people was unchained and led back up out to the real world and saw real sunlight and real trees. In other words, this is the world of what he calls forms or ideals, meaning ideal things. Like in Plato's understanding, somewhere out there, there is a notice like this that is absolutely perfect. Notice this one isn't perfect anymore. It's got a bent corner, it's got a stain. But somewhere out there is a perfect one. Just as somewhere out there, there is an ideal bottle. And every bottle on earth is a reflection of that. Because all bottles have what? Bottleness. What do all bottles do? They contain a liquid, okay? Maybe not even liquid, sometimes something else, okay? All guests have what function? To be able to put something on, to be able to lean on, to write on all chairs. What's the difference between a chair and a stool? Chairs, most people would say, have four legs, kind of a thing. A stool, three legs generally, okay? So there's different qualities. Plato's whole point is that everything down here is a copy. It's an imperfect copy of what is real out there. And what we need to try to do is to get from here to there. All right? So, a dream is itself but a shadow. Rosencrantz, truly, you're right. I, I agree. And I hold the ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. Ambition, the desire for more, is a shadow's shadow. In other words, there's nothing real about it. Hamlet, then are our beggars' bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars' shadows. So, the beggars, he says, the people you see under the bridge at Broad Street on the on-ramps to I-24 and such, or off-ramps from I-24, they are the real bodies. They are the things that are out here. The real trees, the real rocks, the real forms. And what? And our monarchs and outstretched heroes, the baker's shadow. In other words, kings, heroes, not real. And I don't mean not real where he's saying they're fantasy. He's saying they're not the most important things. 
There's something deeper and truer. Shall we to the court? Notice, we're to kings and outstretched, praised, you know, heroes essentially work in the court. It's almost like Hamlet saying, let's go see if I'm right. Okay? So, Hamlet says, when they say, we'll wait upon you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. I'm not going to include, yes. So is Hamlet immediately suspicious of them? Oh, yeah. Because they don't belong there. They don't belong in Elsinore. They've been sent for. Okay? So, Hamlet says, I won't include you with the rest of my servants. No, I'll speak to you like an honest person. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? And what he means is, why are you here? Well, to visit you. No other occasion. Mm -hmm. No, he says. Is it a free visitation? Come, come. Deal justly with me. Speak. What's he telling them? Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. Fess up. Be honest. Gilgamesner, what should we say, my lord? What, what do you want to hear? That's almost what he's saying. Hamlet, why anything but to the purpose? Well, say whatever you want. But to the purpose? Answer my question. Why are you here? You were sent for. And so he tells them, I know why you're here. You were sent for. There's a kind of confession in your looks. Because when he says you were sent for, Every production I've seen has Rosencrantz and Guildenstern look guiltily at each other. Like, oh no, he knows. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, that is, for what purpose? That you must teach me. So, what is your purpose for being here? Well, let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the consummate of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love. Conjure. Like, I'm going to issue a spell. By all these things, tell me the truth. Whether you were sent for or no. And so Rosencrantz says to, says to Gildenstern, what do you think? I don't know. We were sent for. And Hamlet says, I'll tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery. In other words, and you won't have to tell me the truth. You won't have to betray the king and queen. I have of late, I know not why, lost all my mirth. Forgone all custom of exercises, that is, his daily routine, whatever that involved. Okay. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth. He's not talking about his body. The earth seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the sky, the air, look you, this brave overhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, it appeareth nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. It's like ammonia gas, you know, killing. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, that is understanding, like a God. The beauty of the world. He's saying humanity is the paragon, the highest form of creation. And yet to me, what is this quintessence? Okay. So you've had essence. Now you get quintessence of dust. Quintessence, line 289. The fifth essence of ancient philosophy. Supposed to be the substance of the heavenly bodies and to be latent in all things. The ultimate essence. Okay. What do, is man, what is this quintessence of 
dust. From dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. God tells Adam, man delights not me. And then they do something. Before Hamlet says, no, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. So what he's just told us. One, I'm not homosexual. Man delights not me, is one reading for that. And then, no, not women either. Okay. I didn't think that at all, Rosencrantz says. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? You thought, well, of course, you're straight. You like women. To think, my lord, that if you delight not in man, what Lenten entertainment the players shall receive from you. Okay? So he tells Hamlet via those lines, there are players, actors, coming to Elsinore. So if you don't take any delight in human affairs, in human activities, what's the purpose of their coming? Okay? Hamlet says... He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of thee. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh. Gratis, that is without grace. Okay. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. In other words, whatever kind of work they do, if he puts on something about a king, something about a knight, something about a lover, something about a clown, something about a clown, you know, and the lady shall say her mind freely. Who, who are these players? Okay. And we're going to skip a little bit. Hamlet asks, are they children? Line 318. Who maintains them? That is, who runs the company? Who's in charge? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? That is, will they do like Bottom and the others did? Will they overcharge themselves? Okay. Um, so the players come in. 12, page 1273. Hamlet welcomes them, and Polonius comes in. Let's see. Polonius tells Hamlet, line 361, that these actors, quote, are the best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral, comical, historical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral, scene, individual, or poem unlimited. In other words, they, they range the gamut. They can do everything, all right? So Hamlet mentions Jephthah of Israel. You've got a gloss. Go, you can look it up. Judges 11. It's one of the judges. And he said, what a treasure hedge thou. See, Jephthah made a vow that if God did something for him, he'd sacrifice his daughter. And God did it. Jephthah carried through on his vow. He sacrificed his daughter. Polonius, what a treasure had he, my lord? Polonius doesn't know the story. Why, a fair daughter, no more, the witch he loved passing well. Still harping on my daughter. Polonius thinks. Okay? Polonius, if you call me Jeff, Polonius, if you call me Jeff, then, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Okay, now remember what I just said about. Jephthah. He made a vow and he had to kill his daughter as a result of that vow. What is Polonius planning on doing with slash to Ophelia? The language he used before is I'll let my daughter loose. Like setting hunting dogs loose. Okay? Hamlet. Nay, that follows not. What follows not? That he has a daughter that he loves passing well? Polonius. Uh, 
what follows then, my Lord? As by lot God wrought, and then you know it came to pass, and most like it was. He's not making any sense. Why? Antic disposition. So, players come in. Hamlet welcomes them. He recognizes them. He knows these players. He says, I've seen you, you know. And they go on, and Hamlet talks about, you know, you did a piece about Pyramus and Aeneas and Dido, etc., and the guy just starts reciting lines. Okay? Big long passage, which we're going to skip most of. Um, so, Hamlet says, bottom of page 1276, to the first player, can you play the murder of Gonzago? Well, uh, line 487, 488. Ah, we'll that play tomorrow night. He says, and um, you could study a speech of dozen, 16 lines. That is, you could add some lines to it. Ah, very well. Follow that Lord, that is Polonius. So everybody leaves, except for Hamlet. Hamlet gets another soliloquy. Now I am alone. And that line should kind of reverberate. Because it means, one, I'm alone on the stage. Two, you can hear my thoughts. But it also means, I am alone. I am really alone. He can no longer trust his friends. Because he knows Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have been sent for him. And I think he's even starting to suspect Ophelia because of Polonius' interest. What a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, in other words, it's not a real passion, right? It's an image in a dream of passion, could force his soul to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage wand. In doing the lines that the first player just did, he had tears running down his face. He looked like he was really suffering. What's Hecuba to him? Hecuba, the wife of Priam, king of Troy, mother of Hector, who is killed by Achilles, okay, What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? In other words, what if he had to go back to Hamlet's response to his mother about take your knighted cloak off and stuff? You know, it seems per particular with you. What if this actor had that within which passeth all show? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free. Ah, Hamlet's already thinking. He's already said, I'm going to give you another 12 to 16 lines. Okay? Who's the guilty that he's going to attempt, Hamlet, to make mad? Claudius. Who's the free that he wants to appall his mother. He doesn't think Gertrude had any hand in the killing. She does have a hand in the incest. Well, maybe not her hand, but anyways. So he says, yet I, a dull and muddy meddled rascal, peak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause and can say Nothing. I've got real reason to act and I can't do anything. No, not for a king upon whose property a most dear life a damn defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pink, smacks me upside the head is what that means. Plucks off my beard, a very offensive action in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Okay. 
and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat. Who, who does these things to me? Have we seen anybody do any of that? No, we haven't. So Hamlet is saying, why can't I bring out from inside what is in me? What did he tell the ghost? He said, Phew, I'll take care of it. No time. And here we are almost at three. And Hamlet hasn't acted. You'll hear in political conversation, pundits and such, we'll talk about, you know, when somebody's trying to decide whether or not to run for office. Every now and then, they'll describe someone as being Hamlet-like. Why? Because they think Hamlet is indecisive. In, question for you, is Hamlet indecisive? As in, I don't know what to do. It's, it's literally one of the big questions about this play. It goes back hundreds of years. So, Hamlet says, It cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this, I should have fatted all the regent kites with this slave's offal. That is, I must be a coward. Because if I weren't, then before now, I would have done what? I'd have slaughtered Claudius and left his body outside for the birds to eat. Bloody, body villain. Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless, meaning against kind, villain. Oh, vengeance. Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell. Okay, big question. Is he prompted by heaven? Who says, vengeance is mine? The Lord. <laughs> In the Old Testament. What does Jesus say? Someone hits you, do what? Turn the other cheek. Okay? Must like a whore. So I, who have all this reason to act, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very grab. Ah, fine. And then he tells us, I have heard guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they had proclaimed their malefactions. That is, they've admitted their guilt. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll watch him. Notice, I'll observe his looks. If he blenches, I know my course. That is, if he goes white, guilty. The spirit that I have seen, ah, now he tells us this, may be the devil. The ghost may not be the ghost of his father. It could be a demon. Designed to do what? Designing to do what? Trick him. To get him to commit a mortal sin. Murder. Murder is a mortal sin. Okay? And the devil has power to assume a pleasing shape. It's in the New Testament. Not just a pleasing shape, but to appear as an angel of light, St. Paul says. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. So what is he going to do? I'll have grounds more relative than this. Relative. Closely related. Definite. In other words, he's saying he'll have what? Proof. Proof. He'll see Claudius' guilt with his own eyes. Okay? The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. All right. We'll stop there. Uh, don't forget the quiz that is due Wednesday evening. It's over Acts 1 and 2.